Good morning, everyone. Woo, lots of energy today. So glad you're here. I need some help this morning. I want to um, recognize one of our team members. We have Desi on the board here, and it is her birthday today. And I would love if everybody would just say a quick happy birthday to Desi on three. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Desi. So welcome to October Think Tank, you all. On behalf of the Initiative One team, I want to welcome everybody. So glad you're here. We have um, a record registration to today. We actually broke 1,000 people attending our think tanks. So virtually, from a streaming perspective, here in our audience and the building, we're just really, really excited to have everybody here and the investment that you make in yourself and in your teams back at your businesses. So with um, no further ado, I want to bring on Dr. Fred Johnson. Come on up, Fred. Okay. Our founder, our mentor, and uh, my husband. And um, just really glad to have him today. And today he's going to spend time talking about walking the field. Are you connecting as a leader or are you a controlling as a leader? So he has some great topics today. And I'm just going to fix his earpiece before we kick off. Just a little thing. That's the wife role. Yeah, that's the so. wife role. <laughs> all right, take it away, Fred. Thanks, Trace. Good morning, you all. So, so as Tracy said, we have about 1,100 people. Um, it, our, our, the chemistry of our think tanks are, are changing. Um, we're having fewer people here because folks are staying back and they're, have, they're staying with their big groups, uh, which we love. I think there's 600 people uh, in groups today that are watching this and and so it's really cool knowing that somehow you're meeting a need beyond yourself and so you all are the guinea pigs um i want to i am really um i'm really eager to pour into you today and we're going to be talking about how do you shift from being a controlling leader which is the traditional stereotype of a leader. Uh, leadership is, I am the authority figure and do what I tell you to do. To today, the modern leader, it's really not the modern leader, it's the only way you can effectively lead outside of a crisis. And that is being a connected leader. A connected leader leads by relationship. A connected leader leads by influence. A controlling leader, first of all, is a short-term leader. Because I, I want to ask you a question. How many of you enjoy working for or with an ultra-micromanaging controlling leader? How many of you? Not a single hand. I don't know what you mean by that, Tracy. <laughs> so, so you all, I want to ask you a question. And, and for those of you who are in line, type away. I want you to think of someone in your life who is a leader, whose impact upon you has left a legacy that you will never forget them. Um, and that and that their impact upon your life has, has never ended. And when you think about them, you only think about how your life is dramatically better because they were in your life. Can you think of that one leader? Think about that one leader. Now, tell me, and I'm, what we're doing is we're going to look for a trend here. What was that leader, why was that leader so special to you? What did they do with you that made their leadership so mind-boggling in your life? 
just talk. We're just going to talk today. We're just going to be real with each other. So, and online, type out, and Phil's going to be sharing uh, those insights. Tell me, that leader, why was that leader so deeply impactful for you? Yes, sir. They let you be you. What's the opposite of that? Okay. Telling you what you should do. In other words, you had to fit into their frame. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Teacher, coach, mentor. What's the difference? What's the opposite of that? Wow. If, if you have a teacher, coach, mentor, leader, you're the center of their attention. Instead of them being the narcissistic center uh, who wants your attention. Who else? Yes, sir. Patience. Patience. Teresa, you have been incredibly patient. <laughs> <laughs> who else? Yes, sir. Joel says, that person led from a place of purpose, not position. Who else? Yes. They truly cared about me. Okay. Communication and inclusion. James says, communication and inclusion. Okay. Julie. They saw ahead and more Ooh. They could see things in you that you either couldn't see, didn't believe what you were seeing. Powerful, powerful. Yes, ma'am. Verbalizing that, sharing that they see potential in you. Wow. Verbalizing, sharing potential. Emily? Dr. Fred? Is that, I get that right? Okay. Good to see you. Dr. Fred, a couple yes, online. Sir. Um, gave constructive criticism because they cared about me and my success, cared about me as a person, they believed in me, um, they listened and valued my opinion. A lot of relationship comments. Wow. Wow. Who else? Yes, ma'am. Wow. So, why are you here? I'm here because I believe in the potential of being a good leader. You're also here because some need is being met for you. The need, uh, I asked Tracy last night, listen, I've got to tell you that when I do these think tanks, I'm talking to myself even more than I'm talking to you. Um, I've struggled all of my life with self-belief. Um, it is an ongoing effort um, to believe in yourself, to ignore the, 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 the data, to ignore all of the compliments that people tell you that you're making an impact in people's lives. You'll hear 99 people who will tell you that and you go, oh, that's nice. But you'll hear the one person who has the criticism, what do you do? You lock in on it. And so, so I'm talking to you as a fellow struggler, someone who, who, who craves belief um, and craves giving belief. And I said to Tracy last night, the little Freddy side of myself says, how in the world would 1,100 people be signing up to hear what I have to say on a Friday morning. That's little Freddie. Uh, on, the outward, on the outside, I appear confident. On the outside, I appear um, that I know what I'm doing. On the inside, guess what my voice says? Are, are you for real? Are, are you fooling people? Uh, is this stuff really real? And, and yet, Tracy said, here's why people come. Because you give belief. 
you pour into people, and people are craving hope. They're craving a leadership approach that, that loves people, that respects people, that pours into people, and to make people's lives significantly better. And that is so different than the political realm that we live in today. Would you agree with that? When, and so, so you're here at some level. We, are, we crave leaders who pour into us. We crave leaders who believe in us. You all, you cannot stop a leader from being impactful who has a genuine foundation of belief in other people and that they see the good in other people. Does that make sense? What else have you heard, Phil? One of the so it's, um, it's fantastic that someone else thinks that way. Thanks for being real. Um, they talked about uh, the balance that they, they encouraged people to have between personal and professional. And craving hope was another example somebody shared as well. Mm. You know, you all, I wrote four things down before you even said it. Um, they believed in me. They pushed me to be better. Not for our narcissistic, perfectionistic sake, um, but they pushed me to be better because they believed in who I was. Dr. Fred, that would be another one that, that came up. Is they said they kicked me in the butt, but for the right reason. Mm, mm. They also said um, they pushed the trajectory in my life. Because they were present in my life, the back end of my life looked different than the front end of my life. And then they poured themselves into me. You see, that's the difference between a controlling leader and a connected leader. Let me give you an example of a connected leader. A connected leader is about everyone else. And by the way, when you're a connected leader, that does not mean that you don't take care of your needs. That doesn't mean that you don't, that you're not working on life balance. It doesn't mean that you're not, that you're not putting yourself first, but it's a different reason. A narcissist puts themselves first and expects you to put them first. A narcissist has the need to be first in everyone's life and sucks the life out of them while doing it. Make sense? When you are an other-centered leader, you have to take care of your needs first. Why? There is a purpose behind taking care of your needs. And what is it? So that you can be there in the long run to take care of other people's needs. You see the difference? One acts out of self-centeredness the, the other acts out of responsibility to be there for the long term in people's lives. The day after, I, most of you know that, that um, I'm working with two NFL teams right now, um, and one of them is the Miami Dolphins. The day at, someone asked me today, how's Tua doing? Tua is their, their quarterback. And Tua and I... Um, spend a lot of time together. The day after his injury, when everybody in, was talking about, is he going to be around? Someone needs to tell him to stop. Um, uh, you know, it was, he was the buzz on ESPN. If you'd been in, in that room, the only people who were talking about Tua as he was going to be around, nobody was talking about it in the building. Nobody. And guess where, who Tua was concerned about? This was the day after his injury. I walk in the building, and Tua sees me, and he knows that I have a son by the name of Eli who had a traumatic, traumatic brain injury this past year, and we are fortunate that he is here. 
not only is he here, but he's here well. I walked in the building, and guess what Tua, when he saw me, guess what he said to me? Hey, how's Eli doing? That is a connected leader. Not only that, but he said, give me your phone. Call up Eli. And I'm going to and record this. And he took five minutes to send Eli a message. Hey, Eli, just want you to know, man, I know that uh, you've been through a tough time. And I guarantee you, you're probably being bullied by people because you have a scar on your head. And that you probably have gained weight because of your, your medicines that you're under, which he has, that has affected his self-esteem. And here was this guy, a uh, $220 million contract that he just signed, incredible leader, and he was concerned about one person, a 14-year-old kid living a 1,000 miles away. I want to tell you what that did for me. I would walk off a cliff for that guy. I would walk off a cliff for that guy. Tua said to me one day, he said, why are you here? Knowing all the stuff that, that, that you could be doing. I said, Tua, I'm here for two people. I'm here for Alec, and I'm here for you. Because you are here for my son. You see, a controlling leader demands that you charge up the hill. A connecting leader never has to say that. Why? Because you'll do it because of who they are. Your loyalty, your commitment is so deep. Because that is a person who is other-centered. And they live to give hope and to pour into other people. That's a connecting leader. Does that make sense? That's a connecting leader. And you all... Connecting leaders have an, an incredible impact upon other people. They are the best of the best of the best. How many of us want deeply to be a connecting leader? That is leadership. And so, so I have a cousin who is, uh, I don't know if you've caught the podcast with uh, Colonel Bob Mitchell that we just did in the last month. It's two parts. He's been my cousin, um, and he knows me uh, very, very well, and I know him. And we did this podcast. And I learned something about Bob that I never knew in our podcast. He, he was in charge of the medica, med, um, uh, medevac division for the U.S. Army during Iraq. His, his division was responsible when a troop would, when a soldier would be um, nearly blown up or blown up in an, with an IUD device or um, w with um, traumatic, traumatic combat in, uh, injuries. It was he was in charge of the division that would go fly into combat and pick those kids up. You think that he saw pain and agony and unbelievable injury every single day, every day. And in that podcast, he says this. This is what I did. He said, Fred, my, I had 36 posts of soldiers. I had 36 posts. I had 50,000 soldiers that were reporting to me. And my area of responsibility was the size of Texas. And he said, this is what I did every day. I'd get in a helicopter, and I'd fly to, to visit a post. And when I got there, I didn't talk about logistics. I didn't talk about the mission. I didn't talk about all the things that we're not doing right. He said, I simply sat down with the troops and I would start doing this. How are you? No, really. What's keeping you up at night? How's your family? How are they doing back home? 
What can I do to support you? I am so thankful that you are here. Do you know what it would be like when you're a first rank soldier, when the colonel comes to you and spends that kind of time? My son was in his division, flying Blackhawks. And he said, Dad, Uncle Bob is a legend in the Army. He is a legend. People would walk off a cliff for him. Why do you think they would walk off a cliff for him? Because of that. Because of that. People crave leaders who care. If you are a leader who has to show you're in charge, you're a controlling leader. But you're a connecting leader if you are a leader who is consumed with caring for those who are in your charge. Did you hear the difference? Oh, by the way, <clears throat> that applies to every field, every industry. Every field, every industry. If you're an educator, you will know those people who poured themselves into you. Virginia Knoll. I was 12 years old in Hurricane West Virginia. I was a pastor's son. And when you're a pastor's son growing up in a little town of a thousand people, everybody is pointing out why you are not living up to what your father is preaching. And I heard that every day, and my self-belief was like this. And Virginia Knoll was my eighth grade history teacher. She asked me to sit right beside her desk. And it wasn't because I was a troublemaker, even though I was. She somehow showed me that she believed in me. She and her husband would take me fishing. Was that in her job description, to take me fishing on the weekends? I hated fishing. <laughs> if you know my patience, I hate fishing. Don't ever ask me to fish with you. <laughs> but why did I go every time I had the opportunity? Because I got to be with Mrs. Knoll. She was a, she was a connecting leader. And I will never forget her over 50 years ago, and I remember her like yesterday. If you want to change your company, work on loving your people. Work on pouring yourself into people and respecting who they are. Look at their areas. How do I help this person become the best version of themselves? Connecting leaders are world changers. Connecting leaders are world changers. What I want to do is I want to draw a contrast. And I don't want, you guys know I don't like PowerPoint, number one, because I'm from West Virginia. Uh, we don't do technology in West Virginia. Uh, but more importantly, it forces you to use your imagination. And so I want you to take a line of a piece of paper and draw it down the middle. On the left side, draw controlling leader. On the right side, draw connecting leader. And let me show you some of the contrasts. First of all, the left side, my way or what? The highway. When you're on the right side, it's what is your way? How would you do it? You see, the two questions that a controlling leader asks at the beginning of a meeting is, they don't make questions, they make statements. This is what we need to achieve in this meeting. And this is what I expect you to do. The two, a connecting leader doesn't make, make statements, they ask questions. And the questions are, how are you? How are you? And what do you think? What do you think? So I want you to think about this. 
Every Monday morning, I get to spend time teaching leadership to the top 20 most influential leaders in the Miami Dolphins. Think about having these personalities in a meeting room in front of you. Odell Beckham, Jalen Ramsey, um, Tyreek Hill, Tua, every single one of those folks are strong personalities. Every single one of them. Um, when they won their last game, I had 14 players reach out to me within 10 minutes after the game. Hey, coach, which is funny, uh, we won. Oh, we won. They wanted me to know. You know how I start off those meetings with those guys? What do you think, guys? What do you think? One day I asked him, what do you think I'm saying to you when I start these meetings off with what are you thinking? Instantaneously, every one of them could respond. What do you think they said? What do you think they said? When I ask you, what are you thinking? What am I conveying to you? Put yourself in their position. What do you think they said? Talk to me. You care about us. You care about us. What else? I matter. What else? You respect me. What else? Genuine interest. Here's another one. That you know that 20 minds are better than one. It's about humility. It's the absence of arrogance. You see, your people are the same way. So one, it's all about, a, con a controlling leader, it's all about me. A connecting leader, it's all about whom? It's all about you. Um, yes, sir, Joe. You, uh, the controlling leader doesn't feel safe enough so that they need to tell other people what to do. When you ask what do you think, then you feel safe enough in who you are so that they can give you that feedback and you can be connected. Joe, I needed to be in control of this moment, and you just robbed <laughs> and and your answer was so powerful that you're making me feel real small right now. <laughs> Actually, isn't he right on target? You see, if you're a controlling leader, you, you're scared to death of losing control. Because your insecurity is so high that you want everybody to think that you got it together. I don't know about you, but as a former therapist for years, the folks that I would always be the ones that I would be most in question of were the ones who came across to me as they had it all together. You could spend four or five sessions with them and you still were not able to crack who they were. You had no clue of who they were. And yet they talk and they talk and they talk. Does that make sense? If you're a control leading, controlling leader, image is everything to you. The image of I got it together, I'm in charge. When you are a connecting leader, a controlling leader has to have all the answers. What's the problem with that? You don't have all the answers. There's too much knowledge out there. A connecting leader says, I don't know. I don't know. I genuinely don't know. A controlling leader says, oh my gosh, if you say that, it will make you look incompetent. A connected leader says, I'm saying that because it's real. I don't know. But I'm surrounding my people, of myself, with people who do know. Make sense? A controlling leader has to have the credit. A connecting leader wants to make sure you get the praise and you get the credit. Make sense? You guys with me? Um, a controlling leader leads, leads by direct sight. In other words, leadership is never beyond his or her grasp. 
They have to be involved in every customer transaction. They have to be involved in solving every problem. You can't make a decision without their approval. Everything has to be within their grasp. They hold everything tight. In trying to have control, they lose control. Because followership is the gift of the followers to choose to be influenced by you. And when you're willing to be a connecting leader that can let go of the need for control, you still want to pulse so that you understand what's going on. But you carry things lightly. You don't have to lead every meeting. Every, every way of doing things doesn't have to be your way. You recognize there's a million different ways to deal with that issue. And as long as we get there is all that matters. Does that make sense? So a c controlling leader has to deal with everything going on w that within her or, uh, his or her life right there. If there's a problem with the team, that's where I go. A connecting leader takes the long view. A connecting leader asks, when I deal and give this person feedback, put yourself in their, in, in their shoes. How are they going to receive this? How do they receive it in a way that's most effective for them? A controlling leader le leads by direct sight, whatever is in front of them. A connecting leader leads by vision. You see the difference? Direct sight, it's got to be right, I got to be involved. Vision is this is where we're going. This is why we're doing it. I love leaders who lead by vision and principle. Connecting leaders lead by principle. Let me give you an example. We don't have a lot of rules here, but we are very clear on our vision. The statements that I ask my team all the time are, is that a 10 experience? And how we go about things, is that going to provide a 10 experience for our partners? Do you think my people know what that means? There's a reason why we invest a million dollars a year into Think Tank. Because we want our people to have what? A 10 experience. Oh, notice I did not use the term customer. I used the term what? Partner. That's a principle that's non-negotiable here. A vendor relationship looks to get as much out of something as I possibly can. A partner relationship says, how do I pour into you? How do we create a win-win? How, how do we elevate each other? We don't do vendor relationships here. And our team knows that. We lead by vision and we lead by values. We lead what is called a psychographic. A psychographic is we've learned what are the characteristics in a relationship that need to be present for you to have a long-term win-win relationship with that entity. Our team knows what, I don't ask a lot of questions around here anymore, but I ask, is that within our vision? Is that within our values? Is that within a 10 experience? Is that within our psychographic? Are you... Are you equipped to make the decision? You see, a controlling leader only is care concerned about what I think of himself or herself. A connecting leader wants to know what you think. I want you to think for yourself. You see, the irony is, is a controlling leader can cre un unknowingly create what is called a compliance culture. In a compliance culture, you don't think because you've learned if you take a risk and make a decision and it doesn't turn out the way that that person wants it or it's not done in the way that that person wants it, you're going to get reamed. So what do you do the next time it's time to make a decision? You don't. And what do you do? You wait 
And what do you wait for? To be told what to do. So that if there is a mistake, it's not on you. You see, there is no possibility of having a high initiative culture with a controlling leader. There is no possibility that you will be a leader who's afraid, who's not afraid to take a risk in a controlling culture. And what happens is speed slows down. Initiative stops. And taking risks that are part of innovation gets smothered. Isn't that incredible? It's, it's crazy how it works. But let me share this last thing. There is something you need to know. Connecting leaders give high freedom to their people. Connecting leaders give high freedom to their people. High autonomy. Would you agree with that? But here's what people often don't want to hear the other side. With high autonomy and high freedom come high responsibility. With high autonomy and high freedom come high responsibility. If you're going to be given that kind of freedom and autonomy, you better deliver. Does that make sense? That's not an ultimatum. You see, that is the basis of the trust that is in the relationship between a connecting leader and the connecting leader's team. And so, a connecting leader's team is constantly teaching. A, co a connecting leader is constantly teaching. Looking for how to be the best version of you. Not, I want you to do it differently so I feel better about it. No, I am here to help you become the best version of you. And so, for that relationship to work, you have to be open to receiving feedback all the time. Connecting leaders don't wait and wait and wait and wait until it becomes a monumental Thanksgiving dinner. They deal with it when? At a crumb level. So they deal with it as close to the moment. And so part of the culture of a connecting leader um, culture is that they're constantly talking about ways to get better. Constantly. Make sense? It's not out of perfectionism. Perfectionism is, is rooted in judgment and anger and shame. You didn't do it right. When I'm a con connecting leader... My teaching and my mentoring is, meant, is rooted out of respect and love that let me help you. You're, you're better than this. You have so much more potential to impact people in ways that you have no idea. Can I give you some input on how you can do that? Can I give you some impact of how you keep sabotaging yourself and you're so close to it you don't see it? Let me tell you, it takes a very mature person to be on a team with a connecting leader. Did you hear that? Because I'm talking 8.0 thinking. If you're a person who cannot receive feedback without going in your head that I'm being disrespected, I'm being attacked, I'm being diminished, that is 2.7 thinking. A 2.7 mindset cannot exist in an 8.0 connectivity culture. We've had, over the years, we've had turnover. But the 8.0s rarely leave us. See, the connection, eagles want to be a part of a connection culture. A controlling culture can't keep an eagle ever. They will leave every time. A connection culture can't keep eagles away. Oh, a connection culture is one that can't wait for Monday 
when it's Sunday. A controlling culture's team can't wait from, for Friday when it's Monday. You know what I'm talking about? And we've all been a part of that. So in a connection culture, there's constant feedback. Not for commit, uh, perfectionism, but at a commitment to excellence to be worthy of our high cause. And if you are a leader who can't receive feedback, you break the foundation of the relationship trust. Make sense? Because for me to be able to give you the autonomy that you need, I need to know that if I do give feedback, it's going to be received in the intent that it is given and that you're going to act on it. And that after five conversations, you're still not doing the same thing because you don't care enough to make the adjustment. So when you have a connection culture, there's constant feedback, there's constant adju adjustment, and there's constant growth. Does that make sense? And if you've got someone on your team that you keep giving feedback in the spirit of love and respect, and they keep blowing you off, you all, that person is giving you information of whether they can fit that high culture or not. You with me? It's a two-way street. I say to people who want to be with a connecting leader, be careful what you ask for. Because that connecting leader is going to be mentoring you and pushing you and pushing you and pushing you. Why? Because they care about you. And let me tell you something. I tell my team, if I go back into micromanaging mode, we got a problem. And the problem is, I'm not, I'm not if I start asking when you're showing up and whether you got your task done, we got a bigger problem. The bigger problem is, is that you haven't been receptive to growing and being open to feedback. And when you've got a connected leader that goes back into micromanaging, that person who feels they're being micromanaged better be asking a tough question. What am I doing that I'm not living up to my part of the deal here? You see, it goes both ways, doesn't it? How much time we have? One minute. Okay. What are you thinking? Has this resonated with you? So I want to ask you one question. Of all the things that you've heard, your mind has said, oops, oof, I got to get better than that. Have you had that moment? Now I'm asking you to do something for me. You're not serious about change unless you declare it to someone else. Because when you declare it to someone else, you are now asking for what? Accountability. You're not serious about change unless you want accountability for it. So already you've come away this morning saying that's one or two things that I really need to work on in my life if I'm going to be a connection leader. What are they? I'm asking you before the next hour is over, you will have talked to at least one person and said, these are my challenges that I am going to work on as a leader to, to get my game on a different trajectory. Would you be willing to do that? So in the four minutes we have left, <laughs> with the one minute, take a risk with me. What's the one thing you're working on? Talk to me. Don't... Connection cultures don't have crickets. When the leader says, what do you think? Guess what the team does? They tell you. I'm asking you, what are you thinking? What is that one thing? Yes, ma'am. I don't want to control it all. I don't want to control it all. Yes. Nervous system regulation. Say that again. Nervous system regulation. Thing, nervous system. Did you go to Harvard or something? <laughs> Self-restraint. 
Mm. You know you're not safe, then you can take care of yourself. Yeah. By the way, systems, a controlling leader says it has to be my decision. A connecting leader says, let's build a framework for decision making together so that I don't have to be in the room when you make a decision. And the Big Mac is still going to be the Big Mac, whether you're in Los Angeles or Boston. Make sense? Yes, over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, admit to not knowing things. Admit to not knowing things. Okay? Anybody else? One thing that you're going to commit to. Yes, sir. Culture. Culture. What's that mean? So as a connected, you know, being a connected leader, you have the right that down the culture of the people. Yeah. You bet. Kevin Anderson, one, on, one of the things I know about you is you are a connection leader. You are a great connection leader. Anybody else before we roll it up? Has this been helpful? So I'm going to ask you to speak to one person. This is what I'm working on. And if you really want to be serious... My email is fjohnson at initiative1.com, O-N-E, don't spell. If you're really serious, send it to me, and I will follow up. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you really want me in your corner because I'll give it everything I've got to help you be the best version of yourself. Connection, controlling. Who are you? What are you committed to becoming? Thank you. Thanks, Fred. As always, inspired. I have a big announcement today. Um, we have our conference kicking off in June of next year. And June 10th is registration, two days, 11th and 12th. Um, we have limited registration. As we announced today, we have 1,000 people online today, over 1,000 people, and this will be limited to 300 leaders. It's an intimate conference. It is a learning conference, and we have some great lineup of speakers that we're putting together, including Dr. Fred. And if you want to bring your team and help your team to grow, please get registered early this year. We'd love to see you. Registration is open today. And we'll be actually sending out formal communication next week. So if you've attended Think Tank, you've got the, the early start on it. So we look forward to seeing all of you. Thanks so much for being here. Next month is our anniversary month. And so next month, we're going to be celebrating the wins when the scoreboard suggests otherwise. How do you keep your team inspired? So thanks, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Take care.